let, let, let's begin uh, with, with some music now. Uh, that was one of the songs of my sort of youth, that Tracy Chapman song talking about a revolution. And the images of people on welfare lines crying at doorsteps, being ready to rise up and take what's theirs seems to sort of resonate today as much or more than it did when I was young. In the song, she says it sounds like a whisper. And I think many revolutions do begin like that. They sound like a whisper at first. The song ends with, you better run, 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 because finally the tables are starting to turn. Now, clearly for this crowd, running is, uh, is not an option for the EBBF. Although maybe I was uh, thinking this is a crowd that might run towards the problem, not away from it. And running towards the problem and getting engaged and doing something in behavior and particularly talk a little bit about the area in which I work, investment, and how we think about turning it towards social good as the sort of topic for today. Revolutions require and bring about a shift in the perceptions of what people consider acceptable or possible. They're about redefining success, if you like. They're driven by clashes in moral frameworks, deep prejudices or assumptions that are upended and transformed. But great change, real revolution, I think requires four things. Firstly, a context for change. Secondly, that a vision is opened up. Thirdly, that action is taken in small ways by ordinary people. And fourthly, that we create the space of the legally and practically possible around that vision so, and that action in order for it to scale. And all of this requires moral vision and moral action. And it often begins with individuals making small changes in their hearts and in their personal behavior. And that's the whisper, I think, that the song refers to. The quiet acts of moral leadership and courage by individuals in small ways and places that leads to change on a grand scale. Now, there's a concept um, that I'm going to try and sort of reference here, and I'm going to try and zip through it fairly quickly. Um, but there's a concept that's become popular, even somewhat controversial in recent years, called the Overton Window. It describes the range of policies that are politically acceptable um, to the mainstream population at a given time. Ideas that a politician can recommend without sort of having a you know, complete public reaction, appearing too extreme, and of course, in the sort of political context, getting re-elected. And along with that idea, as it developed, there came with various theories of change about how politicians and policymakers can redefine that window, can open that window up, can shift it from left to right. Um, originally, it was described in a sort of top to bottom uh, spectrum. It's often presented here, left to right. There was, it was meant to avoid sort of traditional left-right sort of political um, a continuum, but this is how it was developed along with some sort of uh, additional work that was done afterwards as a spectrum from sort of less freedom to more freedom. It was a, a range of things that were completely unacceptable and then sort of fringe and narrowing in in the center around what's mainstream. And then that window of what was sort of practical and possible, the window of discourse as it's called, um, was there described as the Overton window. So if you're thinking about policies or something, I thought I'd choose something completely not controversial, like gun control. Um, you can imagine at the either ends of the spectrum, and I will do this in a way that is sort of hopefully not too controversial, you could imagine extremes such as guns being available for sale at supermarkets to children on the one hand, and then being illegal for any civilian for any purposes, even toy guns at the other extreme. Those are extreme policies, uh, all of which are held by people in at least one country in the world. Um, now, the task of many people in civil society and in politics is to act on that window, to try to shape public opinion, to open the window up, to make certain policies or, or possible or even more popular. Um, so we require for any set of change for there to be um, 
a moment of opportunity. We require example, voices and actors in society who can model and demonstrate new ideas in ways that open up the realm of the possible for others. It's about vision. And this vision often comes from artists in society, but it can come from others. And at scale, it almost always comes from religion. Now, of course, those examples can be positive or negative. They can make ideas desirable or unacceptable. And they can, but all of this is important uh, in, in showing people what is possible. The next is action. Action is crucial and it almost starts with individuals, individuals changing how they act in small ways. And then, as I said, in translating this to scale, there needs to be an environment, what people are allowed to do and encouraged to do by policy and law. And that also impacts on the space of how people think and of course, how they behave. So what's possible, as I say, changes dramatically according to a historical moment and a collective experience. Profit-making can be acceptable and glorified at certain times, but profiteering during times of war is generally less acceptable. And to return to gun control, of course, there have been moments in New Zealand and Australia, for example, where following sort of a terrible, tragic mass shooting event, there has been a sudden possibility for sudden change and sudden um, uh, action to, 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 be, to be made in the policy space. Uh, I'm just getting better. There we go. So, you know, if we look sort of historically at moments in history that have created uh, windows for significant change, of course, we can look at the horrors of World War I creating this opportunity for the League of Nations. We can see how World War II, by the time World War II had broken out, the headquarters of the United League of Nations wasn't even complete. And uh, of course, the institution had failed. But for following World War II and the horrific suffering of World War II, the UN was formed. And at its third session, 48 nations voted to adopt the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, one of the great um, statements of vision uh, that we have in modern history. The preamble begins with that visionary statement, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and unalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. That moral vision painted so strongly and visibly for all to see. And this vision translated into action with the establishment of economic institutions, the claiming of independence, etc. But before long, the Cold War descended and that vision was dimmed. And then with the fall of the Berlin Wall later, there seemed to be another moment of possibility and the Millennium Goals, and more recently, the Sustainable Development Goals, which represent an unprecedented articulation of a vision. In the case of the Sustainable Development Goals, one developed collaboratively by almost all the nations of the, of the world, um, representing an, an articulation into clear and actionable goals for collective action. And in a recent letter to the Baha'is of the world, the Universal House of Justice, the governing body of the Baha'i community, talked about just this historical process of crisis and victory. And in this, they detailed a vision for world peace that Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, laid out in his writings. And they talk about the organic unity of the people of the earth that is the pivot around which that, revision, that vision revolves. And they also detailed the essential role of individual action. They quote Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, who said, peace must first be established among individuals until it leadeth in the end to peace among nations. Wherefore, O ye Baha'is, strive with all your might to create through the power of the word of God, genuine love, spiritual communion, and durable bonds among individuals. This is your task. And I think it's illuminating that he should identify the role of the individual, the small, quiet, whispering work of building peace among individuals and link that inexorably to global systemic change. Interestingly, following the Great Depression, um, another extraordinary opportunity was born and another great vision was painted, that of the modern welfare state. William Beveridge laid out those principles in 1942, and in a stroke, people were offered health care, good education, decent housing and support when out of work or unwell, but it represented a huge statement, a huge statement of a vision 
of a social contract. Just six years after the publication of that report, he wrote another document on voluntary action, and in it he declared that he had made a mistake, that his vision of the welfare state left out individuals, communities, and the bonds and ties between them. It was an idea, he said, that was enabled by terrible suffering, very much born from a moral vision of what was possible and what was right, but it began only in a top-down act of state, uh, of state action. And in its original conception, it left out the important work that needed to be done by individuals. So let's, refer, uh, let's, let's sort of return to this idea of the Overton window uh, and my own work in the area of social or impact investment. The spectrum of activity that I'm concerned with is the degree to which the social impacts of investments are factored into the decision making of those who allocate capital. Broadly speaking, those who seek only financial return here on the one end and have no concern for the impact of those decisions. Let's assume, <laughs> this may not be fair, but let's assume up to, uh, but not including the bounds of what is legal, is on the right. And those who you use capital solely for the impact it can produce and take no account of the financial return they see would be on the left. So we might put Gordon Gekko, greed is good, on the right, and we put, might put Mahatma Gandhi on the other, just to illustrate the spectrum. Oh, I have to move the screen, sorry. So instead of a window of acceptability, we probably have a distribution of capital across that spectrum. Now, this is a sort of conceptual presentation, I have to state, I know there are some very smart and learned uh, uh, folks on this call who are real economists and, and are uh, burdened by facts and, and figures, none of which trouble me very much. In this presentation, I'm going to plow on regardless and just assert that this is conceptual um, and you know that one might expect or hope to see a fairly normal distribution around uh, in the center of that in around a balance between social and financial impact with a tail on either side. And one might imagine that the bulk of our finances in the world will be deployed in that sort of balanced approach. I'm getting quite a lot of background noise. I don't know whether that's coming from somewhere, but um, anyway, Lara, just to let you know, maybe we're not on mute, I don't know. Um, so with the exception, uh, however, that turns out not to be the case. And we saw this in the, in the case of the sort of financial crisis in 2008, it seems actually that increasingly money is skewed to the right, that there were uh, decreasing levels of concern or awareness, not of concern, sorry, not of awareness, but in terms of the distribution, in terms of sort of where the bulk of money is deployed uh, in, in our markets and in the world uh, towards the right of this. Now, what the, there is in the world that I work in huge claims, though, of the massive growth of forms of investing, which are considered uh, on the left of this. And I think, unfortunately, that a lot of that growth uh, comes rather by cheating, by moving the, the, the definition of social impact, by sliding that over to the right, what becomes acceptable uh, it seems to grow that there is a volume of what is considered social impact. But actually, if we look at the real change uh, in the way in which capital is deployed, I think more of it is to do with shifting nomenclature than it is with shifting behavior. Now, I want to take a bit of a turn here, move away from the charts, talk a little bit about some of the work that, uh, that I'm doing and the sort of current moment and crisis we're in. We're currently thinking hard about, of course, everyone in the world, about vaccines, about therapeutics, about diagnostics, about how the world responds to this extraordinary pandemic. Extraordinary in the sort of global coverage and the, and the common shared experience that it's, uh, that it's creating for all of us. Uh, how, no matter how uh, divergent those experiences are uh, from different people in different parts of the world, and indeed different socioeconomic circumstances. But it is a moment where we are certainly examining the role of healthcare and indeed the role of 
our pharmaceutical industry, and we are looking with hope to the production of vaccines. So as we think about sort of how we, how pricing of drugs and things operate, and we think about our, our sort of spectrum, uh, people will remember the, the sort of unacceptable face of drug pricing, the famous sort of Martin Shkreli a few years ago, the so-called pharma bro, who pursued this explicit strategy to identify drugs with little or no competition and raise the price. I mean, people will remember that there was a drug used by AIDS patients and as an anti-malarial uh, that he was able to corner the market on and when increased in price overnight 56 times from $13.50 to $750 per pill. Now, in that case, the media caught on, the company he owned collapsed, and he is now in jail, but not for what he did in that instance, and not because of the drug pricing. In fact, he was uh, jailed not for harming people or patients, but for financial misconduct and for harming shareholders something he'd done in a previous company. But that feels like an egregious example. It feels like an outlier. And it feels like maybe that awareness of that maybe shifted the window of acceptability to, uh, away from those extremes. Maybe it shone a light on what was not acceptable in society. And hopefully, it moved the boundaries of that window slightly. It reframed what was possible, what was acceptable. Let's look at what's going on around us in terms of how vaccines are being developed, how companies and governments are responding, and let's see whether really anything significant is changing. Almost all the vaccines that are in development for COVID-19 were developed with public money at various levels in various ways. There may be the last mile of development, and I, I want to stay up front again, there are probably people on this call who know this industry far better than I do, I have been in the last two months uh, as you know, the, the head of a, a, a philanthropic investment fund uh, seeking to respond to the crisis and do what we can on a crash course with my colleagues in our public health program uh, in this area. Uh, this is not an area I've worked in historically. It's an area I've learned a great deal about in the last few months. But it's an area that I'm working in. I'm a few meters away uh, from you know, one of the first uh, clinical trials of, of, a, of a vaccine at scale here in Oxford. And I've been working uh, on almost a daily basis with the director of that program. Uh, and we're involved in, in, a, in a number of fascinating ways, which I'll, which I'll mention a little bit about confidentially, uh, in how we might, you know, have acted in the past with regards to vaccines, it's very worrying. In, eight, in the H1N1 swine flu packet, pan, pandemic of 2008, the US bought up almost all of the available global supply of vaccines for the drug. They stockpiled more than 200 million doses, depriving large parts of the developing world, where indeed the, the disease was spreading, of any supply at all. The US didn't actually have the capacity to even store the vaccines that they bought properly, effectively, for long enough. And so in the end, they only used, and because of the spread of the disease, 90 million or so of those doses. They sent some to developing countries, but more than 70 million doses were burned. They were destroyed. Now, you say, well, that was a terrible thing that happened in 2008, not during the global pandemic. It's not possible that companies or countries would behave like that. But I can tell you, as you're seeing, as we've seen in recent days, Oxford did a deal, a global deal, to sell out the vaccine, developed entirely with, private, with public money to AstraZeneca in a special deal that will advantage, they hope, the UK at least in some way. The US uh, has a, 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 a drug development agency, BADA, which has an explicit mandate to, to advantage the US. It has no mandate to seek a global development of vaccines for, for the world. It has an explicit uh, mandate to make early stage investments and buy up access and control to vaccines for the US at the expense of other countries. And you will have seen 
the, the uh, press recently about Sanofi, the French company, uh, seemingly having to back down after this kind of behavior. And I could talk about pricing and pricing of diagnostics. We are scanning the market for uh, new diagnostic uh, tests that will be available. Those tests that will be available to run on large scale uh, proprietary platforms and labs, and also those tests that will be available uh, for use in the home. Tests for antigen, if you have the disease, tests for antibodies, if you've had the disease. And there's lots of science that's needed to know wh which of those matter and whether or not and what conclusions we can draw. But I can tell you from what we've seen on pricing that there will be margins of, uh, of 90 and, and plus percent made by companies during the pandemic that large you know, global pharma take uh, uh, will generate billions of dollars of revenues during the pandemic simply for uh, uh, passing on uh, licenses to uh, medications that they own and to technologies that they have intellectual property for at this moment. And that will result in thousands of millions potentially uh, suffering uh, and potentially, of course, death uh, around the world. And so I, I have come to see, you know, what the, um, quite how intense this, the, uh, problem is in terms of shifting the window of acceptability and bounding what sort of behavior is possible in this kind of a context. Um, I, I maybe just talk briefly about you know some of the work that we're doing. What we are finding though is in the context of uh, governments and, and sort of large uh, investors stepping in to buy up and take control of these technologies, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to uh, provide early stage financing to, in the case of, of uh, you know, uh, some of these vaccines, to fund pre-production of these while they're still in clinical trials in large enough volumes in the global south so that where, if they are successful and they do pass through clinical trials, those uh, vaccines are already available for use and they're already available in areas that will need them most. There are of course very hopeful signs. There are coalitions coming together to create uh, both public interest campaigns that seek to change the window of what's possible around this issue. Um, the people's vaccine, vaccines for all, there's a number of these sort of campaigns that are emerging and there are also commercial actors who are taking the high road and choosing not to profit from this in various ways. Um, and there are also investors like ourselves and others. And there are coalitions uh, and there are organizations uh, around the world that are seeking to broker global acquisition deals that will set you know, minimum levels of pricing. So if we shift back to the window and we talk about a revolution, how do we do that in moments of crisis? How do we Take, how do we create real change and shift the window? So the first um, condition, as we said, is that we need this historical moment. And it seems from what our you know, sort of study of history, that it does need to be a moment of, of suffering or of change. Now, that wasn't the slide I was expecting to see. That's interesting. So I need to work on how do that. Ah, that's taken me by surprise. Well, here's what we need to do. Uh, I don't know what the next slide will be. Let me find out. Ah, there we go. So we'll do it the other way around. Well, what do we need? First of all, we need a context for change. Then we need a vision of what should be done. We need action uh, on an individual scale, what is being done by real people in real places. And thirdly, we need the context of enablers. We need things to change in our environment that allows individual action to scale and create sort of systemic change. And we will come back, yes, to the Tiger King, I promise. Because if we've learned anything during COVID-19, it is about the Tiger King. So the context is crucial. 
that so fundamental a revolution involving such far-reaching changes in the structure of society can be achieved through the ordinary processes of diplomacy and education seems highly improbable. We have but to turn our gaze to humanity's blood-stained history to realize nothing short of intense mental and physical agony has been able to precipitate epoch-making changes that constitute the greatest landmarks. One would have hoped that the financial crisis gave us one chance in 2008. Recent history suggests we failed to take that opportunity. Quite possibly the global pandemic offers another. 36 million people unemployed in the US is a lot of people wasting time in the unemployment lines, as Tracy Chapman sang. Surely this must create some more of the necessary conditions for change as the suffering uh, spreads further and wider. So I want to return to those three things that we must do, what we should be done, what could be done, and what can be done. And I'll just net back. While the third is usually where we focus, we focus on laws, we focus on practical changes, we focus on the things that can be done on changing the sort of window. But the first two are really difficult. And the first two, what should be done and bringing change into individual lives are really questions that require moral leadership. This is, I think, a useful quote. Very recent article by a very good friend uh, and a, a, a political a uh, lecturer in politics here at Oxford University and a philosopher, Bafa Razavi, who wrote, ultimately there are two kinds of moral work to be done. One is to identify the excellences of the new post-crisis world. And the second is to urgently make these real, to give them not only conceptual meaning, but practical ones. A moment of collective crisis calls on each of us to become moral visionaries, to create a world we do not know and cannot describe. So I want to talk about each of those two things, the moral vision that's required. Where does the vision come from? When our politicians have become business people and our business people have become politicians, when ideologies that the world has turned to on the left and right have all failed to deliver for anyone, and I'm not going to repeat all the statistics on global inequality to this group who know them so well, where does the vision come from? The House of Justice, uh, in, in that same letter, uh, that I mentioned earlier on talks about the need for a vision of shared identity and common purpose, without which we fall into competing ideologies and power struggles. So the need for this vision that has throughout history come, as I said, uh, largely from the, the, the world's great religions that have been able to reframe success, create a vision of what is possible in the world in the moral terms, seems a crucial uh, place to begin. So I, I, let me give you one example, uh, though, from literature and, and sort of recent sort of uh, popular culture of how the vision that we hold in front of us can affect how we think about um, the possible. I think some of you may have seen an article recently uh, about called The Real Lord of the Flies. I don't know if anybody saw that. There's an article in The Guardian. One of the, you know, one of the most popular novels uh, in the 20th century that, def that, that spoke to who we truly are as, as sort of human beings. It was supposed to, to, to be a story that revealed that beneath the veneer of our civilization, we had beneath us the hearts of savages. And it's a story, as many of you know, about a group of boys who were shipwrecked on an island and as they were stripped from the sort of strict, uh, the restrictions of society, they, they became savages. They turned on each other. They created a very uh, dangerous and dark world and, and ended up fighting amongst them, killing each other. And it was meant to show who we really are beneath the veneer. And it became a sort of dominant idea. It became an idea that shaped not on its own, of course, but as an artifact of its time in the post-war world, it became an article of faith that people behaved in barbarous ways if they weren't regulated and restricted, and that we had to act in ways in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. And it was all right for markets to operate like this because that's who we truly were. And we needed bounds, but not too many. And this was 
a very dominant idea. I'm not attributing it solely to this book, but I'm sure I, I want to make the point that art and you know philosophy and moral visionaries in the world have a power to shape uh, ideas that influence how we think about ourselves. Now, a, 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 a recent article shared uh, a recent recent article was about to be a book about humankind and about cooperation. Um, uh, that that's the article that I think has just been shared in the chat, uh, which everybody's now reading instead of uh, in, instead of listening to, uh, to 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 me chat. But that's fine. It's probably multimedia. Maybe that's better. I find I've been doing these Zoom calls. I pay attention to about two percent of what anyone's saying because I'm always reading something else. Sometimes it's related, sometimes it's not, but it doesn't matter. I'm gonna hang in there because you're all lovely people and you've made an effort and I'm sure that um, we'll get to the finish line together. And I'm probably talking too, uh, too, too long anyway. I'm, Laura's gonna give me the wind up. But in this story of the real Lord of the Flies, he goes around and he searches and he, <laughs> thank you, Anne, I saw that on the chat. That's very sweet of you, I'm not. <laughs> um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the real Lord of the Flies, he goes and he searches and he says, well, what happened? Were there ever a group of boys who actually got you know, shipwrecked on an island anywhere? Has this ever really happened? And if it did, what, what did they do? And of course, he finds this story of a group of boys in Tonga who were shipwrecked on an island and who created an extraordinary harmonious and cooperative uh, environment for themselves. They were discovered by uh, 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 an Australian fishing boat captain 15 months later, and they were intrinsically cooperative and collaborative. They weren't in that in, in, intrinsically um, uh, uh, combative. In a tiny side note, which will be amusing to, to some of you, uh, Peter Warner, the captain, uh, was deeply affected. Uh, the captain who found them was deeply affected by this, by this insight into the nature of humanity, uh, who we really are. He actually changed his company, he moved his life, he became active in Tonga, he created a new business, and some years later he became a Baha'i uh, and actually was part of establishing uh, this extraordinary um, uh, uh, educational institution called Oceans of Light. In, uh, in, in Tonga, uh, which is a, a now an institution that, that supports uh, all sorts of uh, moral development in the region, as a side note. But I think this sort of idea that uh, many of the ways in which we think, the visions that we hold in front of us of who we are and how we behave, uh, we have to examine them carefully and we have to look for where those, that vision will come, make sure it's grounded in the reality of who we really are. So the next piece of work, as, as uh, Bafar Azavi said, is to urgently make these real, to give them not only conceptual meaning, but practical. And it's hard, as he says, to create a world we do not yet know and cannot describe. And this is the difficult work of making change at an individual level. Those who study this talk about pre, whoa, here we go. That's a little bit exciting, sorry, that's my, uh, cursor getting a bit ahead of itself now the presentation's finished and there we are um, they talk about prefiguration about how we have examples in front of us we, we can become what Cass Sunstein calls a moral cascade how small, small actions lead step by step to systemic change and this is hard because people have to begin to act differently even when the advantages and the benefits of acting like that are not there Someone has to move first. People can change their economic behavior even when the economics are clear at all. They can act in a way that may at some point lead to global sort of systemic economic change, but in the short term doesn't. They have to act against their interests in some way, but for a higher reason. And so this concept of interests is malleable. These things are all in our hands to change. We look at the Baha'i community's model of change around the world, it exemplifies this. It exemplifies this, this work that begins in the individual with individual change and that is manifest through a coherent life. To our action and behavior, but in small ways, in ways that begin 
to um, uh, begin to create change at the systemic level. But now I'm going to try and get the next quote. Here we go. God knows what's coming back. But here we go. And I think in my last talk, and I'm sure many times have, uh, people at the EBBF have sort of referenced this fascinating letter from the House of Justice in 2017. Every choice a Baha'i makes as an employer, employer, producer, consumer, borrower, lender, benefactor, or beneficiary leaves a trace. And the moral duty to lead a coherent life demands the economic decisions are in accordance with the ideals. This translation from moral vision into personal action. We treat the economy as if it's separate to society, but actually it is society. So I, I could talk now, but I'm very conscious of time, about how we are doing this, uh, making these, uh, these changes. What we're doing as an investor is not only funding, uh, in the first category, funding examples that create and show the vision of what is possible. We not only fund sort of demonstration projects, we now never support those who are uh, articulating and, uh, and, and, and painting a vision of what is possible. And we do that both with our investment and also with our grant making work. But in this next category of, of action, we've undertaken quite a significant process of examining how we behave if we are investing in ways that are meant to create sort of social justice and a change, for example, in the status of women, and we're investing in funds, as we've done in the last month, we made two new investments uh, in, in sort of women-led entrepreneurship funds, women's world banking, uh, and, and an African identity fund. But if we're doing that, and we're not doing the hard work of examining how we operate, how we select our investments, how implicit bias feeds into our work, then our work is not coherent. And so we have you know, undertaken quite a significant effort to examine how this behavior manifests itself in us as an organization. I'm gonna jump now to the third of these, which is where most people start, which is about the, the, the enabling environment. And it's important, but it's the least important of the three. But it is important. It's important because it's about changing laws and regulations by creating infrastructure that people can use to scale change. It's about developing in individuals the capacity for change at scale. And it's important to remember that we do have to work on this environment and we do have to move the bounds of what is legally al allowable. We have to expand the window, or trim the window on one side of what is allowable. We've been doing that during the crisis in a number of ways. We've been funding the creation of new platforms that allow large forms of public finance to get to communities. So in the US, for example, we've, we've, we've funded a number of platforms that take this uh, CARES Act, PPP money, the payroll protection money, the billions of dollars that have been provided to sort of help businesses in this crisis. But that money is not getting to communities of color, to not-for-profit organizations, to businesses in disadvantaged areas simply because there is no way for the money to move and so we've been using the community development finance institutions network and we've been supporting infrastructure at the same time we've been lobbying and and working on getting change in the policies about money that gets allocated to different communities and that sort of technical work of of changing the bounds of what can be done in a particular moment is also important it's very important though to know what you're up against. And Lara, I'm gonna sort of do this and this is, we're, we're in the home straight right now. Um, it's, it's very important to know what you're up against in, in framing these kinds of changes. And you have to understand the nature of the challenge, the nature of the window. I received a, an advanced copy uh, of a book on impact investing. I can see it here, called Impact with a big dollar sign with nice little hearts in it. Isn't that nice? Um, so everything's fine. Um, on, on impact investing. And on the black is a blurb from Bono, who's extraordinary, by the way, and done wonderful things. And in it, he says, capital isn't immoral, it's amoral. It's a wild beast that needs to be led. And so here is a book about how you can lead a wild beast. But here's the Tiger King reference. 
you can't lead wild beasts. You don't lead wild beasts. Wild beasts eat your arm off if you try to lead them. We have to understand that capitalism is, I think, as, uh, as, as Bono says, it isn't that it is only immoral. It's amoral. It actually will have uh, a, a particular... Um, <laughs> Laura's... That's lovely. Um, uh, it, it has a particular direction to it if led unbounded. And so uh, uh, everything in COVID-19 is about Tiger King. And so let's remember what wild beasts do when you try to lead them as opposed to taming them. Seatbelts weren't introduced into cars by high-minded manufacturers. It took legislation. Fire escapes weren't included into tenement buildings by moral high-minded developers. It took lawsuits. Capitalism is a beast, and like the story of the scorpion and the frog, it is in its nature to sting, and we have to recognize that and make this third piece of work accordingly. So, um, this brings us back to the window of what is possible, and of course, making those changes and making those regulations is only possible in an environment of uh, where the window is open to those opportunities. And what is it that shapes and moves the window? Let me return to that original, and I hope there's a final slide with it. Maybe not, no. Um, it is the context for change. It is the vision for change. It is the small moments of individual action that, that, that are undertaken by individuals wherever they are. And that leads us finally, ultimately, to the sort of technical change, uh, but that's not where it begins. So. Finish with Tracy Chapman. Anyway, thank you for uh, bearing with me.